Good. Okay. So we have our next speaker, Chu Xuan Yi. Uh, and there is an important uh, note from the speaker. He wants you to pay attention carefully to his words. Okay? Let's go. Hi. Um, I'm Xuanyi. And um, Xuanyi is a noun. Okay? Now, um, this is my hand. And her hand is a noun. This is a pen. A pen is a noun. This is my book. A book is a noun. Right? Uh, actually, I do need that book. Uh, this book is for me to read. All right? And read is a verb. There. Uh, this is my book too. This book is for me to write. And write is also a verb. Now I speak. Speak is a verb. Got it so far? We now know what a verb is and what a noun is. Define is a verb. And to define means to show or tell what a word means. What I just did was to define the words hand, book, pen, read, write, speak. Example is a noun. An example means a thing to show, uh, to help define what a word means. What I just did earlier was to define the words hand, book, pen, read, write, and speak with the help of examples. Now, let me define more things. Many means more than one. Order means many things in a line. First the square, then the dot, then the line. That's the order. A sentence is many words in order. Valid means good by the rules. Now, a grammar is a set of rules that defines whether a sentence is valid or not. A vocabulary is a set of words where you know what the words mean. A language is made up of a grammar and a vocabulary. A language has all the sentences that the grammar and vocabulary can make. Now we can write down the rules of a language. Here I have written it down in BNF. This line says that a sentence is made up of a noun phrase, then a verb phrase, then a verb, verb, uh, verb phrase. A noun phrase is drawn from a set of known nouns. A verb phrase is drawn from a set of known verbs. Now we know what a language is, what a grammar is, and vocabulary, let's play a game. On the screen is, uh, are three signs for a language I made up called Lian. Right. The three signs are Lian, Kaj, and Jing. And this is how you write the words for this language. Lian is a noun, Jing is a dot noun, Kaj is a verb. These are the rules for Lian. Now that we know the rules of this language, the game we, we, are, uh, we will play is whether a sentence is valid or not. Let's play along. Is this sentence valid? No. Is this sentence valid? No. Is this sentence valid? Yes. Oh, you guys are... Oh. Is this sentence valid? No. Is this sentence valid? Yes. Uh, it is valid because it starts with a verb. Um, is the sentence valid? No. This language has a short grammar. It is not hard to write it down, but it is quite hard to write the grammar of some languages. But first, I need to define one more thing in order to say more. A syllable is the sound that the mouth makes. A word can be made of one syllable or many syllables. As I said, it's quite hard to write down the grammar of some languages. And an example of such a language whose rules are hard to write down is the language that I have been using to speak so far. I shall now tell you the rules. I only spoke in words of one syllable. And when I need to use a word that has more than one syllable, I must define it first. Then I can use it. I want to be more free with the way I talk, so I shan't be keeping up uh, with this language anymore, though I'll be, I'll be keeping up with the spirits of the rest of my talk. 
Hi, I'm uh, Shuni. And basically today what I want to talk about is uh, languages and large language models. I'll be explaining what they are, uh, how they learn, and how they get so good at generalization. The language that I used in the early part in the first two minutes of my talk so far is something I call Steelish, named after the guy who invented it, Guy Steel. You know, the scheme guy. Um, I'll talk a bit about Steelish, but first I want to recap. I said that a language is a set of words, um, which we call a vocabulary, a set of rules, which we call the grammar, and I showed you how the rules of a language can be written down. I wrote it down as a BMF because we're all programmers and we know what BMFs are. Um, for simpler languages like context-free languages, it's quite easy to write down the rules, but the grammar of natural languages like English is much, much, much harder to represent. In fact, it took until the early mid-2010s before we have good enough language models that can represent a, a, a vast proportion of natural language. Um, models capture the essence of something, right? So now we know what a, a language is, and I'll soon talk about models. But first, I want to talk a bit more about grammar. It's important to note that grammar only per pertains to whether a sentence um, is valid or not, right? Grammar itself is, is a model of language. Specifically, for the most parts, is a model of the syntax of language. Given the three words that we've been talking about with the noun and verb class, we went through six of all eight possible uh, cases. And, and there are other components of language, right? One, one that we'll be talking about is uh, the concept of semantics or what a sentence means. You see, words have meanings. And when you put together words in a sentence, the sentence has meanings too. In the made-up language that I made, Lian means person, catch means bite, uh, Ting means dog. Um, the, the, the two valid sentences, there are only two valid sentences, right? Uh, they mean very, very different things um, in, 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 in the made-up language that we made, just like in English. And we say that these two sentences have uh, different semantics. And the reason why they have different semantics is because when I created this toy language, I imposed uh, a word order. Okay? So uh, English, for example, has um, subject, um, verb, object order. So in the sentence, man bites dog, man is the subject, and dog is the object. Right? In, in Japanese, the, it's a subject, object, verb order. So if we were to translate that sentence that you have on screen to English, word for word, it will, it will, it will be man, dog, bites. Now, I bring this up because there's an Australian language called Marin Patha, uh, in which there are no um, word order. So the sentence that is equivalent to uh, man bites dog and the sentence that's equivalent to dog bites man, they can mean the same thing. The semantics of the language of Marin Patha is highly context driven. By the way, Marin Patha it, uh, it means good language, strong language. Uh, so let's go back to Steelish for a bit. You could understand me when I spoke Steelish, although I, I did mess up a bit and um, you, you could follow, right? Uh, that's because Steelish inherits the vocabulary and the grammars of English. But we also added additional like, grammatical rules. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to call such things uh, sub-languages. Right? We, we call Steelish a sub-language that's embedded in English. Okay? Now, a fun fact is that we use sub-languages all the time. Right? Instead of saying vocabulary, we say someone uses a lot of jargon. Doctors use medical jargon, lawyers use lawyeries, and programmers use programming jargon. Jargon is simply the uh, vocabulary of a sub-language that is embedded within another language. Um, the other way around would be a super-language. Singlish, for example, is a super-language because there are simply more Singlish sentences than there are English. And yes, Singlish has a grammar. You cannot simply put la anywhere in the middle of a sentence. So um, here I list some examples of sub-languages. And despite the simplicity of this, this slide, I think this slide captures a lot of the essence of what I'm going to explain. Right? The key thing to note is that I list internet text as a language. And it's true that all the text on the internet ha follow a set of rules. If you, if you consider for a, a, a bit, right, uh, all the code on GitHub, they're all written in different programming languages, right? but they're all still subsets of all internet text. And the main reason why I've brought up the notion of a sub-language is because I want to introduce the idea of Gold's theorem. The full Gold's theorem is uh, going to take a bit longer than I have time allotted for, so here's a two-minute version. And in order to get this going, let's set up an abstract scenario, right? And I, I want to stress that this is an abstract concept. It's not how any real language model works, but um, it sort of abstractly explains it. So to set up, we'll imagine that we've got a speaker and a listener, and the speaker used the grammar G to generate sentences of language L. 
The, listen, the listener listens, and after some time, should be able to use uh, G, finds out G, and construct languages in um, language Elm. Okay? We say that the listener has learned the language uh, L when the listener is able to do, do this. But to make things a bit simpler, we are also going to say that the listener has learned the language when the listener is able to um, identify what language is being spoken. Now, this seems a bit strange, and for many years I thought this is a silly thing to equate um, learning and producing a language with identifying a language. But recently I understood why it was set up like this. Um, after a most interesting experience while observing a family and, and a child's um, language acquisition process. Come find me after the talk if you want to hear the story. But for now, let's uh, play through this scenario. Okay? So um, the listener listens to the speaker and considers a list of hypotheses. Which language could it be? To make it more concrete, let's, let's list this uh, list of hypotheses um, so that it looks something like this. Okay? The listener will first consider the, 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 um, the, the speaker speaking English. Right? And then as long as the speaker speaks a sentence that is a subset of English, the listener stays on that hypothesis until the end of the sentence. But as soon as there is a sentence that is not a subset of English, then the, the listener moves on to the next language, which in this case is Chinese, and so on and so forth. Then the listener hits on the hypothesis that the speaker is speaking language L infinity. What is L infinity? Well, L infinity is simply the language that is a superset of all the languages, like the example that I gave earlier, internet text. Right? So all the Go sentences that this speaker is speaking would be valid under the hypothesis that uh, you know, this is L infinity. So the listener never actually converges on the language Go. The listener never actually learns Go. And this is important because the semantics of Go can be very different from the semantics of internet text. Now, Let's go back to the Lian language that I created. So far, there are two valid sentences, and here they are again. I'm going to write two more sentences, and let's label these sentences one to four. Now we have four sentences in this world. The entire world has only has four sentences, and there, therefore there are po 16 possible um, languages okay? in this world, uh, labeled over here, 16 languages. Now, let's imagine that there are two listeners in this world, which we'll call Alien and Kiasu. Um, Alien has learned two languages, we are, say language 6 and language 11, and Kyasu being Kyasu, or Singaporeans who get this, uh, has learned all the languages. Okay? Now I'm going to speak to them both. I speak, I say the sentence number one. Alien can immediately identify what language it is, right? But Kyasu has to listen to all the sentences that I'm ever going to speak before being able to identify what sentence I'm, what language I'm speaking. Now, this example seems a bit strange, a bit contrived, but it is something that underlies statistical learning. See, in order to generalize, a statistical learning algorithm cannot memorize. And if you are into statistical learning, you might have heard of this concept referred to as VC dimension. Right? You can think of VC dimension as the measure of complexity of the data set. Right? And the key to statistical learning is that a data set can only be learned if it has a finite VC dimension. Natural language as it is has an infinite VC dimension. And yes, I can see you over there. Um, we do have ChatGPT. So let's talk about large language models, right? Um, large language models, LLMs, they seem to fly in the face of like traditional linguistics. So what is it about LLMs that make it so different? Well, to begin with, there are a number of LLMs out there. And, and for the purposes of this talk, when I say LLM, I mean the chat-oriented LLMs like uh, GPT-4 or Palm 2, which, is, which powers BART and GPT-4 powers ChatGPT. Now, there is a market difference in the way uh, chat-oriented LLMs are trained, and that makes, it, makes them a bit more interesting. But first, um, LLMs are deep neural networks. So let me give you a very quick one-minute introduction to neural networks. A neural network is this. Don't look at the drawings, they're all wrong. A neural network is a mathematical function, but you can think of them as a function like this too, except you don't write the body, right? You let the machine learn what the body is. And how does it do that? Well, let's return to the mathematical expression. Here, we see uh, W and B. These are called weights and biases, and we, can't, we also call them parameters, right? So when there are more parameters than data, so when there are more rows of W, then there are rows of X in, in, in your entire training set, then we say that a neural network is over-parameterized. 
Now, a neural network is made of a linear transformation followed by an application of a function. Usually, the function is some sort of nonlinearity. And the other thing that you'll note is that x, w, and b are kind of number like things, right? They have to support operations like multiplication and addition. So, a thing to bear in mind is that we'll have to take our, our raw inputs and somehow encode them into these number like things before we pass them on to the function. And if we adjust w and b, the function changes. The output of the function changes. So you can say the function, the thing that the function is doing changes. And we change the function until uh, it does the thing that we want it to do, and this is called training. There is a disciplined way of doing it, but the specifics are way beyond the scope of this talk. But the interesting question to ask is, what does W and B represent? So let's consider uh, linear regression, right? The, the goal of linear regression is to find the line that best fits the data points. And we all know from high school what the e equation of a straight line is. It's y equals to mx plus c. Um, and here we say that we only need two numbers to know what a line is, which is m and c. Does this equation look familiar? If we were to replace sigma with the identity function and m with w and c with b, we get the same thing. Well. Kind of. We don't usually write C as B. Uh, rather, we consider like C to be a constant one in X. But those are the details of, of uh, details and consequence of using matrix notation. The really, and, and if you think about it, B is like a C but acting on a sort of data set level. The key thing to take away, I think, is for you to understand that weights and biases represent the knowledge of your data, just like M and C. So, this is a neural network. Uh, a deep neural network is simply this, stacked on top of each other many, many times. All right? And you can run the same linear regression that we talked about earlier using a deep neural network, except now your M and Cs are spread out across the multiple Ws and Bs. And it turns out this is very useful for large language models, uh, as we'll see when we talk about uh, generalization later. So. Large language models are deep neural networks, right? They're trained with specialized protocols. And in general, th uh, there are three steps to training a large neural network, which is the pre-training step, the supervised fine-tuning, and the alignment step. The pre-training step, I think, is most familiar to anyone who has done any kind of machine learning. You take a bunch of data, you feed it into a, an algorithm, um, and in this example, we, <coughs> we give it an example sentence, hello, go for con Singapore, and, and we feed it to the LLM, and we want the LLM to predict, predict the next word, Singapore. Now, the, in, in, in practice, um, pre-training steps are a lot more complex than what I have in here. You don't just ask it to continue. Don't necessarily ask it to just continue the sentence, right? You can, uh, you can do things like mask an input, replace the input with uh, empty space, and ask it to fill in the blanks. And, and, and there are various ways of pre-training the LLM, but the key is that pre-training the LLM um, makes the neural network really, really damn good at filling in the blanks or continuing the sentence or whatever the task is. And to do this, you need a massive amount of data, right? Um, mine, you copy the entire internet and put it as an input data set into the LLM. This is also where the LLM gets its vast majority of its knowledge. Now, after we pre-train the, the LLM, you give it a different set of training data, something that is more curated. You teach the LLM how to do things. You give it um, a, a set of, uh, let's say you, you train your LLM using a masked input, right? And then you give it a new task to continue the sentence. The, the, the data set basically are, uh, are a set of continuations that the LLM is expected to continue. It's basically teaching, giving instructions to the neural network. And last step is the alignment step. Um, what you do in this step is quite simple. You generate, ask the LLM to generate five continuations, five completions, and then you give this list of completions to a human being and ask them to rate, find the best or to rank them, okay? And then this information is fed back all the, into the LLM and you update the weights and biases. This way, the output of um, L the LLM would be aligned with the values of humans, allegedly. Um, it also has the unfortunate side effect of making the LLM um, confidently incorrect. That's a subreddit for that. Um, so. Earlier, I mentioned that the straight line is representable by two numbers, m and c. Uh, in the case of linear regression, that kind of knowledge is pretty trivial, but language is way more complicated than that. And written text, the, the, the language, the, the subset of all possible languages is written text, is simpler than the totality of all languages, but it's still quite complicated. And so, how do you think about these things, right? 
um, you can think of the weight of an LLM model as representing the grammar of a language. But the grammar is not pure. That's because when we train the neural network, we train it syntax and semantics at the same time. And so the output data does not differentiate syntax and semantics, much like what humans do. So the, the grammar of the, of, of, the, of the language is quite linked to the content, uh, knowledge content of the language. When I started this talk, I spoke in Steelish. And the, I said that the, the rules of Steelish is hard to write down because the rules of Steelish depends on the context or, or content of, 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 the, of the sentence, being that you know you have to have you have to have a definition before a use. Now, if you are a computer scientist, you might jump up and say, "Hey, use something like dependent type systems, right?" And I would agree with you, but that just goes to show my point that it's quite difficult to write down the rules of something like this. Now. Let's take a look at another example. There's a very interesting paper that came out recently that says LLMs have a world model. Basically, it knows that New York and is it Washington? Uh, sorry, DC are, are close together, and so on and so forth. It has concept of space and time. Question is: Is this a feature of the LLM, or is it because language, through its use, contains the world model, just hidden from plain sight? We can't see it f from reading the language, right? Um, so we can actually test this. Okay? Um, does, the, does the knowledge of the LLM come as a side effect of learning the grammar of, the, of, of, of a language? Or does it really know? Okay? Um, you can check this yourself too, by the way. How good, how good is your understanding of addition? All right? Can you do one plus one? Yeah, I think nobody, no, no, nobody would have a problem with this. Can you do hello, the string hello plus the string world in your head? Again, most people will not have any problems with this. But what about red and blue? What is red plus blue? Okay? We are taught, taught to think that red plus blue is purple. But again, in its simplest form, if we encode like the colors as a binary array of uh, RGB, then we get red plus blue equals magenta. And you can work it out for yourself. Right? You, you can work it out why this works, and you find that the math actually sort of flows all the way through. My point is this. If you know 1 plus 1 equals to 2, you can work out why red and blue, red plus blue equals magenta. LLMs, on the other hand, have no such true knowledge. My, my words, true knowledge. But um, we can show this by, by, by an example of addition, right? We use addition because the properties of addition is very well known. We've, it's been studied for the last 100 or so years, and it's very well known. So here I wrote the basic rules of addition uh, with the words of the elements and the names of the operation replaced with random strings. Uh, more here means plus, and hola in this case can be one or, or can be any basic one-like element, all right? And ChatGPT does just doesn't want to do addition. On the other hand, I gave this to ten, 10 people, ten humans, and all of them understood it was addition. I did have to coax them to actually read the sentence, but once they finished reading, they knew immediately this was addition, right? Now, you can say that this is just me testing the algebraic reasoning skills of um, ChatGPT rather than the actual knowledge of addition. But it doesn't really matter because I'm introducing this technique to show that a lot of the so-called good performance comes from memorization of the structure of language. And yes, LLMs me memorize the world. The more parameters it has, the more it memorizes. So here I have Euclid's postulates um, written down with some basic definitions. Uh, I took the text from Oliver Burns' uh, 1847 Elements of Euclid, um, and I replaced all the key nouns with consistently random strings. Then I asked the LLMs to generate the next postulate. Here are the results, and if you replace the strings back with the original replacement, you'll see that both ChatGPT and Bart actually re returned the correct rewording of Euclid's fifth postulate. Again, this is very highly prompt dependent. If you remove the word postulate and replace it with statements or, or hypothesis, you get quite different results, right? But what is most um, revealing to me in terms of the memorization of the structure of the sentences is that after 100 regenerations or so using API calls and ChatGPT itself, I was not able to get the parallel postulate. I only ever got the fifth postulate. The parallel postulate, in case you don't get it, is a modern restatement of Euclid's fifth postulate. These two sentences mean the same thing. Okay? So you would expect if um, the LLM understands, right, it would, okay, the, the parallel postulate will occasionally pop up. But nope. GPT-4 actually mentions the word parallel postulate uh, more than 40 times, actually. 
but did not once output the parallel postulate. I tried varying the temperatures. Nah, nada. Now, I want to make clear what's happening here. O over here, I have two sentences that are semantically equivalent, but they are syntactically very different. And I showed that LLMs like ChatGPT and uh, GPT-4 actually um, memorize the structure of a sentence, not the sentence itself. There is something funny going on here. And it has got to do with the notion of um, intrinsic dimensions, which I'll talk about. Uh, most of the studies that, that, that deal with like LLMs and memorization, they, they primarily work on the no notion that LLMs memorize the sentences itself, not the principal components or the lower dimensional projections of the sentences. Um, so I mentioned earlier that a good learner cannot memorize. But we know LLMs memorize about 6% of the data. So why do they generalize so well? Well, we see people claiming all sorts of things. Oh, uh, GPT-4 can code Flappy Bird. Wow. How many examples of Flappy Bird are there in the internet? I think one of the main reasons why people think LLMs generalize so well is because we're not very sensitive to that notion that LLMs um, memorize the structure of, of a sentence. And we conflate that uh, with the LLM understanding the semantics of a sentence. Heck, I think we humans don't actually understand generalization that well. See, to start with, there's more than just generalization, right? Um, LLMs do very, very well on the interpolative and extrapolative kinds of generalization, but try anything out of band and it wouldn't work. The, the, the key thing to understanding why LLMs do so well in the extrapolative and in, in trap, uh, interpolative generalization is to understand what the neural networks are actually doing. It's, so what they do is they map all these highly, very high dimensional language data into much, much lower, uh, uh, a manifold of much lower dimensions. We call this the intrinsic dimension, right? Um, uh, a manifold is like the plane of existence of data. The plane of existence of, of us humans is, is a flat plane wrapped around a sphere on planet Earth. But, um, so that's, that's what a manifold is. Um, and nowadays, the, the, the neural networks that we use are way, 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 way over-parameterized. And to give you a, a, a more concrete understanding, right? So let's say you only have 10 examples in your data set. Uh, but your, your, your weight has 20 rows. Roughly speaking, you have spare capacity to do something, right? And, this, it, and the spare capacity in the neural network is used to carve up, uh, basically think of it as drawing grids on a manifold and drawing smaller and smaller grids, right? Uh, smaller subregions. And you might hear um, people talk about these things as grokking or double descent. And this is true for all neural networks of this, this kind. Basically, anything, a function that is uh, not Comograph, Arnold, or uh, N, N is Lipschitz. And this is also true for all modern LLMs. Um, in the context of um, modern LLMs, especially the chat-based one, in the pre-training set, the data sort of settles into a manifold of continuing the next si sentence. And then when you put in your RLHF and your fine-tuning, it sort of changes the plane of, um, plane, plane of existence. But because the manifold has so many other small subdivisions, it actually has a lot of degrees of freedoms to, to, to guide the data towards it. So is it any wonder that these LLMs perform well? And really, the way I think about LLMs is that they're just a statistical model of a database. Uh, for really large models like GPT-4, the database happens to be the entire internet. Uh, it also happens, as a side effect, to be quite good at language understanding and generation. Now, there's been a lot said, right? Ooh, existential risks and all that. If you think the GPT class of language models are able to think, then I want, you, I want to be quite clear about what this is. You're also saying language is capable of thinking. This is a very strange thing to say. But if you, of course, if you consider like language is a meme, and much like a gene, a meme is selfish and wishes to replicate itself, then it of course makes sense. But I don't want to think about languages like this. The way I like to think about languages is that languages are a tool for communication, not a tool for complex thought. So. Um, these are the key takeaways. I'm largely going to skip this because I really want to talk about Go. This is GoForCon. Uh, one last thing, though. I do want to talk about the, the, the problems with the current approach of the ways we're doing things. I'm sorry, Saoshang, but I don't think we ju should just be using LLMs. We should be training LLMs. Okay? So one thing to note is that all these models, right, they're all trained by large corporations. Oh, boy. Okay. Ah, there's a live demo coming up, but clearly there's no time for that. But you know, you're basically sleepwalking into a nightmare scenario, right? Um, I, I brought up Marin Partha earlier, but Marin Partha is a language with no free word order. The internet text has a lot of uh, biases built in, and, and all these large models will not be able to service people who speak Marin Partha, for example, right? 
Um, and we're going to skip all these things. Um, we've gone through the way. Why? Um, now, so I expect that people will start running into these fundamental issues quite soon. Okay? They're going to start fine tuning the models, and that's where I think Go can shine. One thing you note is if you take a look around the LLM world, right? Um, everyone's using Python. Go is sort of left out of the game. But this is not to say that no good work is being done with Go, right? So, for example, Matteo Grella wrote a family of libraries called Spargo, which, is a, which, which are pure Go libraries for doing LLMs. And if I'm not mistaken, he'll be talking about his latest library, Cybertron, uh, which is a library for doing RLHF in Go at GopherCon AU next week. And I've given a few talks at GopherCon Singapore, right? All, all about things about building neural networks. That's me um, talking about building a chat-based system that turns English into, into code and SQL in 2017. All these use Gorgonia, which is a family of libraries that help me write neural networks. Um, the irony, of course, is that I started writing uh, Gorgonia because piano was unbearable to use. Uh, every time I update my operating system or, or my QDRAP drivers, I start praying to the environment gods. This is still true today. And that, that, uh, you can make a lot of money selling stable uh, de deployment environments to people. But that doesn't fix the underlying problem. And my personal philosophy in life is to cause as little harm as possible. So that option is not acceptable. And that has been the core driving motivation for Gorgonia, do things correctly. Now, the Gorgonia family of libraries is going through um, a, a period of change, basically to incorporate gen uh, generics. And that will be a story for another time. But last minute, sorry, I'm just going to say where Go can go next. Um, there are many very good reasons to use Go. I'm not going to go through them, but the, I, want, I do want to go through the two major cons. Right? I would argue that these two reasons is the reason why Go hasn't sort of caught on in the deep learning world, and these are the same reasons why Python has sort of dominated. Because it doesn't matter that Python is slow. Right? You can express your thoughts in higher order languages, and then you can rewrite the slow bits in C and C++ because the FFI is so good. And this is a problem. But Good, the good thing is, as, as David Deutsch puts it, all problems are solvable. Um, I got so tired of the former problem um, that I created an APL to reason about neural networks. Um, originally, this was going to be a live demo, but I do have a backup slide. So bear in mind that um, the, these, these libraries are going through a lot of changes, so some things are broken. But the idea is that you, you, you write um, a language that, that lets you think about these neural networks in high, very, very high level uh, semantics, and then you get this to generate the Go code that works. Uh, the next versions of Gorgonia is going to pretty, be pretty exciting. There are many, many, many for more features coming, so um, this is where I have something to ask you for. The ask is this, right? LLMs are definitely taking off, but we should not sleepwalk into it, right? We have to take control of our own destinies. Don't leave it to OpenAI, Facebook, and whatever the other company is called. Um, we have to train our own models, fine-tune our own models. And I, I claim, my claim is that with Go, you can do it in a stable manner, right? Because, you know, the alternative is m spending many, many, many days manually revetting 2,000 Python packages so that you can just get Stable Diffusion XL to run. Um, thank you for coming to my talk. Thank you, Xuan Yi. I'm so sorry for running over. No worries. Um, we're actually going for a short tea break right now. So a quick 15 minutes tea break, unfortunately. And we'll be back here about 3.20.